and we will be continuing in the book of Jonah. I think there were outlines back there. We are moving into another thought, even though we're not leaving Jonah chapter 1. I want us to consider some things in Jonah 1 yet and still. Um, So if you have your outline, the title is going to be Jonah or Jesus Lessons on the Love of God in Christ. This second sub title is what we'll be meditating on tonight and Friday. And the lot fell on Jonah. So I want us to begin to work through like what that means. So I'm going to open in a word of prayer. We're going to have some introductory thoughts. As you see in your outline, there are three main points. We will definitely get through point number one. We will probably be able to touch on point number two. And we'll wait till point number three for Friday to unpack more fully um, its redemptive implications, et cetera, et cetera. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for the class with us in-house. We thank you for those who arduously and uh, faithfully watch us online as well. If there are those yet coming, give them traveling mercies. We pray for the whole family here at Grace, every family represented here, and the body of Christ around the world. Now we're asking, O oh Lord, in that you have providentially gathered us around your word, you have remembered us. Help us to remember your word upon which you have caused your servants to hope. This is our comfort in our affliction because your word gives us life. And we need that now. We need your grace to to understand. We need your grace to appreciate what we hear at the level of it being able to transform us. We need your grace, O oh Lord, because of the potholes in our life and the pitfalls that are strategically set up to cause us to fall. And we need you to help us to avoid them, both in terms of our attitude and in terms of our course. So go before us as the good shepherd that you are and uh, help us to see, identify, and avoid the things that would hinder our growth and your glory in our life. So we come to you on the grounds of the forgiveness of sins, the shed blood of Christ, washing and purging and sprinkling our hearts clean so that we have the boldness and confidence to come into your presence, whereby we have made, been made accepted in the beloved, the righteousness of God in Christ, immutable, unchangeable, irrevocable. We thank you for it. So Lord, do what only you can do. Open our eyes that we might behold the wonderful things out of your word and may they take a hold of our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to be reading verses four through seven, and then we're going to just <clears throat> tear some thoughts apart today and uh, and get ready for maybe a deeper analysis of the proposition. A lot fell on Jonas, uh, on Jonah, verses four through seven. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man to his God and cast forth their wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was going down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was deeply asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, what does this mean, O sleeper? Arise and call upon your God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. <clears throat> and they said, everyone to his fellow, come, let us cast lots that we might know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonas. Thus is the reading of the scriptures. I keep using the term Jonas is New Testament, but Jonah is the Old Testament version. We may rightly adduce saints that every event that occurs in history has a cause behind it. Would you agree with that? We might rightly adduce that every event in our life has a cause behind it. Um, That's a kind of rationale that human beings and only human beings are burdened with. And because of it, When we are struggling with storms that come into our life, as is the sort of main optic in our opening narrative, the storm that came in. Remember what we learned about the storms? The storms are necessary. 
You guys remember that? Storms are necessary. So I, I will have to kind of remind you of certain uh, assumptions and presuppositions that we have already established. Storms are necessary in our life because storms are designed to do what? Wake us up. I need you to understand that that is what God does. And we could then take the concept or the metaphor, the analogy of storms and apply them in so many areas of our lives where calm is like the normative experience that we have and that calm can be both beneficial and dangerous to us. And certainly when God sees it fit, what he does is disrupt the calm by a storm. And we know that. And we know that. So when a storm occurs in our life and, and we know it's designed to do what? Wake us up. Please get that. Uh, and, and waking up has uh, three modes of characteristic is is becoming aware of it and then responding by arising up out of our sleep and then doing something about the storm that's at hand. We learned that last week as we saw how the people of God called upon God to wake up to rise up and to do something because there is a threat at hand. And therefore, I do want to remind you that God brings these disruptions to wake us up out of sleep that we often inadvertently and unwittingly fall into. And those sleep modes are um, vulnerabilities on our part to misinterpret the context in which we are in and, and, and God would not want you and I misinterpreting our situation because we can do that on so many levels and we can, we can, we can, we can misinterpret, misdefine. We can, we can operate out of uh, situations in which our optimism is inappropriate when at that time we should not be as optimistic as maybe we should be critical in our thinking. There are times when, uh, we might uh, be careless in our thoughts when we should actually be sensitive to what's going on. And it's part of the human liability that often we are not in that place where we're in tune with God. That's one thing. Secondly, and this is more on the larger scale of human responsibility. This is where we're about to go because I want us to understand what's going on in the narrative. When events occur in our life, that wakes us up. We are then engaged in a process. I call it a process of discovery, a process of discovery. Again, animals don't do this. Human beings do. Animals don't don't particularly uh, care why uh, a predatory beast will come in and take one of his cubs. It doesn't reason and rationalize the cause. It only is aware of the event and then it will respond by its limbic system out of fight, fright, or flight. It doesn't sit back and reason through the grounding cause or predicating behaviors or predisposed situations that would lead up to that event. Human beings do. And we have to because we're called to a higher level of activity and understanding and therefore engagement with our arena than animals. Human beings created in the Imago Day have a mind that mandates that we make sense out of crazy. It's important. It's important. This is important. So that's, I'm just going to kind of establish that point. Uh, people people that want to live a fairly consistent, coherent, productive life are constantly working out the, the complexities and conundrums and the ups and downs. That's called being responsible. That's a gift God gives you. It is a moral and ethical responsibility that requires a spiritual lens to be able to negotiate crazy. But, but this is why you and I are looking at what it says here in verse seven. And they said, everyone to his fellow, come, let us cast lots that we might what? No. Understand the cause behind this storm. OK, and so this is really important. Uh, understanding causes. Sense making is what they use in cognitive uh, uh, theory. The idea of, of sense making, sense making, how to determine 
what is the root of this particular problem? Like a root to a, a branch in a tree, we want to know. Proverbs 26, 2 uses a very interesting proposition. And here's what it says. It speaks concerning Proverbs 26, 2. It speaks concerning an event. And here's what it says. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, in this same way, the curse causeless shall not come. Birds don't wander. Uh, swallows don't fly inadvertently. They all have intrinsic in their DNA, a process of uh, trajectory towards different places and different sources for feeding and having their young. They are pre-wired to go in certain directions. And they don't get there by accident. They get there by a, a, a DNA mechanism and all the other factors in their physiology that allow them to do it on purpose. Am I making some sense? Salmon swim upstream because that's where they came from. Animals have all of this intrinsically in them. What they don't have is a level of brain activity that allows them to think rashly in terms of oughts, ifs, ands, and buts like you and I do. They do it according to instinct and nature. Right. But as you watch them, and I love watching uh, animal programs, you see the salmon swimming upstream, heading right back to its original home. It's a beautiful thing. But the law of averages are going to make it to where they become now part of the food chain. Now, you are never going to find a salmon turning around, looking back when a bear swoops up his partner and him going, where did that bear come from? I wonder what that bear is doing there. Who let that? So it's important for you to understand the principle here because humanity, because of the fall of sin, is in a food chain dynamic too. Sin has entered into the world and it, and it operates in the same kind of way with us. If it could, it would allow chaos to disrupt our uh, dignity of choice making based upon sense making. Does that make some sense? Choice making based upon sense making. And this is what's going to prepare us for this. So um, under uh, point number one, for whose cause is this evil come upon us? That's my point. You see, only human beings talk like that, right? Who caused this? That's the right way to think. That's the right way to think. Even though the intellectual, the rationalist, the agnostic, the um, atheist might say, why are you using a personal pronoun? Why don't you say what causes? Well, we can employ what, but we also can employ who? We can employ who? God wired us to consider who may have brought this storm. See, Jonah lived in a day where people believed in God, even if it was different gods. I would argue that that is a bit of a better advantage than where we are today. And here's the reason why I would say that, because here's what's going on here, just to kind of lay the table out a little bit clearer for many of us so we can understand that the study is not in vain. It's extremely important. Whenever you and I are facing situations in our life that are bigger than us, bigger than us, when they're bigger than us, we want to understand the cause. And if the cause has a persona behind it, we want to know the who. And this is the vast majority of your life is preoccupied with figuring out who did this and did that in your life. Because you and I have a life that's filled with all kinds of complexities and responsibilities and relationships. And frequently we're saying, who called? Why did he do that? What was that about? Am I making some sense? And so here in the larger, uh, in the larger uh, biblical context, what the author is doing, what, what Jonah's event is doing for us is it's helping us presuppose it's right for us to go, who brought about this event that's bigger right now than I can handle? All right. That keeps us sane. That keeps us rational. We can go what to nature if you want to. But nature is not the foundation to reality. Nature itself is a created entity. Behind it is a God that made nature. Right. So we still have to go who? Because rational beings do not believe that things just happen purely happenstance. This would go back to 
uh, Ecclesiastes, if you will, chapter three, verse one. My premise statement, and I want to drive that home, and then we're going to work through what I call a set of processes by which we try to determine who calls this thing, and we all do it, okay? This is going to help us appreciate the concept of the lot, which we'll more fully unpack on Friday. To everything, there is a what? All right, so if you stop right there and accept Solomon's wisdom, and Solomon is pretty sharp. Uh, observational skills off the chart. He saw seasons come and seasons go, and most of us know that, right? Imagine a world where there was not the timely process of seasons. Imagine a world where seasons really were arbitrary flourishings of different uh, temperature and ecological expressions that happen happenstance. Imagine a world where it snowed one day and then the temperature was 125 degrees uh, with massive humidity the next day. That would be chaos, wouldn't it? Right. So what I'm what I'm arguing for is that the way God made our world with the order and the coherency uh, whereby we can use the term seasons is to allow us to be able to reason through when anomalies take place. When things out of the ordinary take place, we can go, who did that, right? Since we actually believe that God created So I'm just helping you understand that. So for whose cause is this evil come upon us? Uh, our text actually affords us from verses five through seven, three things I want to uh, impose on your thoughts. And, um, and we'll be able to talk these through more fully on Friday. Because the event is a storm, or right now in our outline, we call it a calamity, right? A calamity is an existential threat. A calamity is a situation that is urgent. A calamity is threatening. A calamity um, is, is bringing harm to you, to your situation, to y'all. And the other thing about the calamity that's at hand is that it, it actually is requiring um, expeditious response. And this is important too. So under point number one, calamity leads us to what? Act. Calamity will lead you to act because it will wake you up out of your temporary mode of calm and rest and sleep because something happened that disrupted. Well, therefore, and this is what verse five in our, our text is doing. Then the mariners were what? Afraid and cried every man to his God. Is that acting? Of course it is. Of course it is. So again, those, uh, the reason why people as a whole are fundamentally oriented to religion is because we have these disruptions in normalcy, don't we? And one of the most practical ways of acting is actually calling upon a deity that you believe to be capable of redressing what's taking place. Does that make sense? Of course it does. And this is why I love prayer, quite frankly, because prayer to me is the most logical and rational response any human being can have to something that is an immediate threat or a conundrum that is beyond our capacity right now to unravel it. Okay, so I'm just laying that out to you uh, under point number one. Calamity leads us to act. Thank you, Lord. And what we're going to see in our outline is that in our text is that there is a pr protocol being performed here. And this protocol is something from which we can extract wisdom and we can talk about it. But sub point B says what? Sustain calamity leads us to do what? Sir. Right. Yes. So now acting is different. Like if you are in the, if you're asleep in the middle of the night, and this is a great analogy too, because that's probably one of the most vulnerable places we can be, is in a dead sleep in the middle of the night, and then something happens, boom, and, and, and there's a shake in the home. You will wake up. Well, we're all different, because yeah, my sister said, and get up, but we're a little bit all different, and we'll help you with that. We're all different, and this is why God is persistent often with allowing calamities to sustain. Because some people will wake up, and it's quiet, and go right back to sleep. Is that true? Yeah. Right. And so many events in life prove that. Because they don't have a sustained experience of existential threat, 
they train themselves not to worry about it and go on back to sleep. They don't necessarily think that something has happened that's about to trigger a series of events and I need to be in the right position to be able to mitigate those series of events or avoid personal calamity. Now, people who have gone through troubles in their life before know, yeah, let me get up. Let me just walk around the house. Let me, let me look and see if I'm dealing with some sustained calamity. Right? Is that smart? Right. So really what we're talking about, you guys, are psychological and spiritual dispositions on all of our part. Some of us are a little less careful in our walk. And as such, the enemy or any enemy could watch how you behave under duress and under trouble and, 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 and actually mark out or map out your pathology. And this is what's happening on a larger global objective as far as I'm concerned. OK, I'm going to just leave it like that. We all get trained by powers that are greater than us that know how to manipulate large social groups. All right. So here we have, however, an event where the uh, forces of nature have knocked on the door of Jonah's life and these mariners. And under sustained calamity, it leads us to do what? Search. That's where we are in the latter part of verse five. Then the mariners were afraid, cried out every man to his God. That's they reacted, casting forth their wares in the ship and the sea, the lightning of them. But Jonah was going down into the side of the ship and he lay there fast asleep. Now, because remember, the waves are still coming. The threat is sustained. They didn't already threw out all the wares. They didn't got the ship as light as they could. Nothing in their conscience says we're OK. Nothing. So you know what that means? Now we're in search mode. It's time now to find out what's going on because we don't have a right to rest. Logic won't let us do that. The warning is still there. So look at verse seven. Here's what verse seven says. This is going to bring us into the consideration of our subject matter. And they said everyone to his what? See, they started talking before they were all individuated in calling on their own God. And then moving about with what would probably have been Mariner uh, protocol in terms of the ship being in danger, loosen everything that's superfluous and irrelevant and that we can afford to lose. We could sit on that for a minute, too, could we not? in terms of its application in our own life. Because if there are areas in our life and, and, and part um, aspects of our life that we are deeply aware of in our conscious are actually um, harmful things weights and sins, Hebrews 12 again, um, you know, as it says, put aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets you and run this race with patience. There can be things in our life after an abrupt calamity that we begin to go, that is not needed. I don't need that. That's got to go. I woke up to go to the closet and that was right in my way. That thing is an enemy now. It caused me to stumble. It's got to go, right? And so what be people begin to do in that threat that is initial is they begin to reason uh, about close objects in their life and how to reorganize and structure things where it makes them more safe mentally, right? That's what the guys are doing, but it's not working. The waves are still raging. So now they're moved to do what the scriptures would say men have to do. You have to search that matter out now. So listen to how Job puts it in Job chapter 29, verse 16. Job 29 makes mention of what would be a characteristic of godly men. And I would also say godly women or wise men and prudent women. Here's what he says. Uh, there, there you go. Um, I was a father to the what? All right, I want to stop right there. Remember, I talked to you about agency arena correlation, the, co the relationship between agency and arena. How many of you guys remember that? All right. I talk about it all the time. This is a subject object dynamic that requires you to know who you are in any given situation in relationship to the arena that you're in, because you need to now be able to reciprocate with that arena to make sure that you are either a benefit to it or it is a benefit to you. All right. So let's just take the first one. A father to the poor. The poor is the object now of the father's responsibility. Is that true? 
I am a father to the poor. This is what Job said he was. That means he viewed himself as a wise man in a community of people who needed his wisdom and needed his resources because they were poor and they didn't have the knowledge that he had. Does that make sense? All right. That's that's what I mean by being a mature believer living in a world, understanding the parameters of the landscape that God gave you and engaging that landscape responsibly. All right. So this would go back to the rich man and Lazarus. Remember how I used that? And I talked about Lazarus just always stepping over the rich man to go where he went. Well, that is a that's a conflict of the agency arena dynamic. Because the arena that was given this rich man included Lazarus. Lazarus was his responsibility. God placed Lazarus there. The rich man went to church every Sabbath day. He read Torah. He knew that Torah said you relieve the fatherless and the widow and the poor. You don't let them just live tearlessly in the danger of loss of life when you've got way more than you need for yourself. Am I making some sense? Amen. All right. So this is what Job says. I was a father to the poor. Now watch this. And the what? And the what? That's what we're dealing with. Cause matters to uh, people who are created in the Imago day. <laughs> Cause matter to us. They matter to us because they have a moral and an ethical implication. Do they not? They have a moral and ethical implication. All right, so I'm going to tie on a recent study that we have been engaged in, and you'll know this is true. This has to do with Cain and Abel. The arena of a brother to brother. Cain is the firstborn. Abel is the younger brother. Is Cain not responsible for the welfare of his brother Abel? That's right. That's an agency arena dynamic. Right. And agents. This look, God knew where Abel was, but he came to Cain. God knew where Eve was, but he came to Adam. God knew where the devil was, but he came to Eve. God expects the hierarchy of a chain of commands to operate within this framework of responsibility. That's what you're learning in your Bible. God is not circumventing your responsibility. If you are a mother or if you are a sister or if you are an aunt or a grandparent or if you have some kind of skill trade or a gift, your gift now has to be executed with a level of responsibility that brings glory to God. Does that come home, you guys? All right. And so um, as these men are functioning on the boat here, they're moving into search mode. Notice what Job says. And the cause that I did not know, I did what? Searched it out. That's what kings do. That's what kings do. That's the Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs chapter 20. Five or 26. I haven't been there in a minute. Verse one or two. Let's see if we can discover that. And I just want to drive this home to you and, and me. Proverbs 25, verse two. Listen to this. And I'm going to start at verse one. These are also the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. Now, now let this come home, children of God. It is the glory of God to do what? All right, so that's getting ready to come home in a minute. We, we got a good 30 minutes. We can talk this through. Do you believe that God conceals things? Yeah. Right. It's obvious because he made you without omniscience. Did that come home? Yeah. So, so you and I are, are a product of God's intentionality for us not to automatically know everything. He made you and I not knowing so that we would be given to the responsibility and moral and ethical objective of searching things out. Does that make sense? All right, good. Because it's really true. It's really true. Um, and, and therefore, notice what it says. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of what? kings and every believer is a king a queen a prince a princess since god is our father and he is our king are we not part of the royal family should not the royal family therefore be known for wisdom 
It should be known for wisdom. It should be known for wisdom. The royal family should not be stupid princes and princesses that are just running around acting a fool, dishonoring mom and dad who have wor worked arduously throughout the generations to get in a position where they can have privilege and possessions and actually then manage those privileges and possessions for people's goods. All right, so bring your view down of kings and queens from Britain and Europe just down to the idea that every one of us probably fits a uh, category of king and queen in America compared to other countries where the poverty level is so abject that they don't even know how to live. They don't even imagine living the way we do. You're a king, you're a queen. Am I making some sense now? It's extremely important, therefore, to know that the job of the kings and the queens is to dignify the office because the office really represents God. That's right. All kings and queens in, in Europe, they knew this. They knew this is why they would have attributed to them uh, characteristics of deity. Right. God saved the king. The king is the angel. Right. The king's word is authoritative. God speaks through the king. All that underscores that when God creates you and me, he creates us with these levels of dignity that require that we behave like him. And that's what Job is doing. Job is a bad brother. Did y'all know that? Job is a bad brother. Read Job chapter 29 in your own time. Job will tell you when the anointing was fully on him. Everybody in the land respected him and the young people sat at his feet and nobody suffered as a consequence of his neglect because he's a great type of who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And so I'm, 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 I'm cultivating this idea so that you can be sensitive going forward that things have causes and we don't always know the cause. But if a calamity or a problem or a situation is sustaining itself in our life, it's moving us to actually find out what's going on. Have you ever had a situation in your life like that? I just want, I just want, I want you to think about it. Situation come up and you really tried to ignore it. Like Jonah. I, Jonah, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sympathetic with Jonah, but Jonah really put himself on a, I'm checking out on God. Like when we get to Sunday, Chapter two, by the time we get to chapter two, guess what Jonah is doing? He's doing what everybody else had already done back in verse four and five, praying. He the last brother to pray. So we automatically know, uh, and this is humorous and I thank God for it, but Jonah was backwards really bad. Do you hear me? He was backwards really bad. And one of the indicators in my own life and my observation with people at large is people who are slow to prayer, people who are slow to call upon God, people who would rather try to work it out themselves through their intellect, through their logic, through their rationale, through their powers, through their money. Th these people are courting disaster. OK, they're courting disaster. There's no doubt about it. So this is uh, this is a principle. Uh, sustained calamity leads us to do what? Search, 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 search. Sub point C. The calamity led them to a point of what? Do you guys see that? All right, because this is going to be where we take up what that means. So under I have three questions here. The first one is who caused it? Question number one. Question number two is what now after we didn't pray? That is a good question. What now? After we have prayed. Can y'all walk with me? Because I mean, you know, we can play church, we can wrap it up. But here's what I know. What I know is people will pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and then stop praying and then don't know what to do after prayer. Am I making some sense? All right. So what I'm about to do is justify the biblical concession on God's part for lot casting. And I'm going to explain that more fully on Friday. Do you hear what I just stated? Because when you understand the casting of lots, it runs all the way through the Old Testament into the New Testament. 
And what's interesting about the casting of lots is that God allows wicked men to do it and it brings about omens on them. And he allows the godly to do it and it brings about answers for them. Right. There's a lot to learn here, though. There's a lot to learn here. Don't don't get lost. Don't get lost. But it's true. And I want us to develop lot casting to understand that lot casting is what is done when we are through praying. Right. Because it's a mechanism for solving what occurs when prayer doesn't give you an immediate answer. It's a mechanism for solving what occurs when prayer doesn't give you an immediate answer. Y'all keeping up with me? All right, so I, I can just tell. Got a, all kind of empty clouds of you. I see them. <laughs> empty clouds of you. I get it. I, get, I totally get it. Proverbs 18:18. 18, 18. Pull up Proverbs 18:18. 18, 18. I'm going to start right here and mess with your head. And because what, what you have the right to do after that you have prayed, and your prayers have moved now into repetition and have not expanded beyond repetition. So when you are praying under duress, your prayers will be ejaculatory and uh, minimally rational. They will simply be a consequence of the weight and pressure of the fear of calamity. And you'll call upon God with whatever little uh, language that you have. And I've already shared with you, that's not a problem for God. Because God doesn't demand that you get it right in the old Saxon English uh, Elizabethan language. God, thou preventest me from perishing. Whither thou seekest me out. No, we, we don't. We, we don't. If the calamity was coming in 10 seconds, your prayer just killed you. Right? So, so, and, and this is an area, so I can, I can, I can put a parenthesis on this. Um, so sometimes when something that's really important, and I get these kind of prayer requests all the time, that's why we do Tuesday prayers publicly. Sometimes when things are really important, uh, you'll pray but your prayers won't be uh, technically or uh, verbally accurate or sufficient. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? All right, so it's important to get this, that prayer is an extremely difficult uh, exercise. It's an extremely difficult exercise. And you don't want to beat yourself over it, beat yourself up over it, but understand that. Understand that it's okay to come to a point where your conscience says, I ain't feeling it. Raise your hand to burn some calories. You get to eat some cheesecake tonight. Uh, and I'm not feeling it doesn't necessarily mean you need to stop praying. But I'm not feeling it means that I don't sense that I'm actually praying because praying actually connects with God. Am I making some sense? You know, unless you've deceived yourself, a lot of religious people do. I'm going to have to actually do a, a lesson on speaking in tongues because I, I inadvertently brought it up a couple weeks ago. And I realized we've got such a new crowd of people at Grace coming that they don't understand, we don't understand what speaking in tongues is about. And speaking in tongues has been one of those practices in parts of the community of the church where they engage in talking to God at a level of uh, inarticulation that has no rational corresponding factors to it. And yet it's alleged that they're connecting with God. Does that make some sense? All right, so I don't want you despising. We got to stop all that. Don't despise, okay? Because they, it's just as bad not to pray than to pray in a language that don't make sense to them or God. Did you hear what I just said? It's just as bad. You are not superior to them just because you don't speak in tongues. If you ain't speaking to God, 
You're just as bad. And then I'm so thankful that God gets past our crazy uh, Lalean, uh, uh, glossy Lalean, or our, uh, as he says in Matthew 5, our, our, our homobotus, our, 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 our language that is repetitive and empty, our modobotus. That's the way um, Christ said, do not be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees with your modobotus, 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 because it's amounting to speaking in tongues. Matabata, matabata, matabata is vain repetition that has no substance to it. It's just a sound that echoes between the skull that makes you feel good. And you feel like you're getting to God when all you're doing is just the matabatas. Jesus says these are vain repetitions that mean little. This is why you don't find us at grace doing the our father bit a lot. Because it's matabata for most people. It's, it's Madabata for most people. Let me help you. So Madabata is a Greek term that simply means saying something for its phonetic benefit. Right? These are Madabata poetic expressions. It feels good to say it, but it means nothing on the part of the person doing it. And of course, God is not a pagan God in need of irrational, unintelligent, unintentional, uh, 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 you know, a rhetoric on the part of his people. He just doesn't need it. God doesn't need it. He already knows what you need. So he would rather you learn how to say five words with an understanding than 10,000 in a language that you don't benefit from and has other um, ancillary components to it that can be problematic, which we will talk about. So I'm just saying, first of all, we're not, we're not so much as beating up on our tongue speaking friends and relatives and brethren. We are just obeying Christ and making sure that we are not committing effrontery when we pray to him just because we have some kind of, uh, some kind of language. And it's not angelic language is by the way, as some would assert. That's not what it means when you quote first Corinthians chapter 13. So here, the same thing is true. The question is, what now after that we have prayed? That's a very good and very practical thing to consider, isn't it? Yeah. All right. So this is what we're going to be considering under this particular point. Proverbs 18, 18 says, the lot causes contentions to do what? Stop right there. Isn't that a beautiful first clause in relationship to a storm that is just about to destroy that ship and that storm ceased its threat when the lot was cast and the protocol was followed? Did that make some sense, saints? A lot was cast, a protocol was followed. In fact, a protocol led up to the lot casting and then once the lot was cast, an answer came out of the lot that caused the sea to calm. We want to know every aspect of that theological and, um, and practical implication that we can, don't we? Since, if you search your Bible carefully, as I stated, you're going to find lot casting going all the way back into the Genesis narrative, working its way up through the Deuteronomic code in the book of Le Leviticus. It's how the promised land was laid out to the people of God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the way up into picking up another brother after Judas Iscariot jumped off the ship because he was a reprobate. Am I making some sense? Now, all of a sudden I'm going, okay, God, what does this mean? Of course, I already know, having known for a long time, but I want us to walk our way through what I consider the thing you do after you have sufficiently prayed. Does that make sense? All right. So um, what what the lot casting does, as the text says, is it causes contentions. What are contentions? Contentions are the conflicts that remain when trying to solve a problem for which in trying to solve the problem, you fail and don't have an answer and the conflict sustains itself. We can obviously see it in relationship to people, can we not? You get an individual that comes uh, into your space and they have an art with you. And you go to discussing the art and he has his position, you have yours, she has hers, she had, uh, the other person has have theirs and they build up, lay out all their arguments. And you come to sense after a period of time 
We're making no headway. And what's happening actually is a wall is building up. A barrier is being created that's actually dividing you. But it's a, it's a wall that actually has within it certain psychological and emotional factors that re, retains or sustains the threat of the conflict. All right, so this is not a literal wall. It's a psychological, it's an emotional, it's a spiritual wall that if it remains there, it becomes the symbol of the threat. So every time you even think about that person, your, your blood pressure goes up. We're human. We're human. So the storm in our account with Jonah represents a lot of things, doesn't it? It represents a lot of things. And we have been wise human beings to pray. And we have been rational enough to talk it through. Remember what the text says? Going back to the text, it says in the uh, Jonah account, and the men talked to each other and communicated with each other as to who might be the cause of this. Do you remember that? They, they, so they, over verse seven, and, and, and they said everyone to his fellow. They talking now, we got to cast lots. Because don't nobody seem to know the answer. And, uh, and, and God means for us to understand some things about that. So under point number one, sub point C, the calamity led them to contentions. Unanswered prayer means that there is a potential for a strife of spirit, a conflict internally that leads to torment. And, and here are the things you can write down to think this through for Friday as we get back into it. Um, a contentious situation is first and foremost distracting. It's distracting. Would you agree? Yeah. You know we're sensitive creatures. If you have a conflict with someone or some issue is going on in your life, it's going to keep you from sleeping. It's a distraction, one. Secondly, it's annoying. Does anybody know what annoying is? This, this one is really getting at you, just, just, just grinding in. You're trying to avoid it, but it's annoying you. Now it's raising, raising the level of emotional interest in that particular situation. And then beyond the annoying, it becomes disturbing. Now what it's doing is disturbing your normalcy. Does that make sense? Like, so a thing can be distracting and you can actually learn how to manage distractions. But once it becomes annoying, it's drilling in and it's disturbing your equilibrium, right? So you know that too. This is so important to know. Isn't it a beautiful thing, child of God, to be aware of the periods of peace and tranquility and stability and normalcy that God grants you? Yeah. Have I not been talking about that for years here at Grace? I talk about uh, the kind of person who does not do well with normalcy. This is a drama person who is addicted to drama. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Right. And, and I wouldn't say Jonah is addicted to drama, but he's a good candidate right now. Okay. He's a good candidate. And we'll flesh that out more because by the time you get to chapter four, all he has done is found him a seat on the top of the hill, still waiting for the judgment to come. Jonah got issues. Don't he? Yeah, Jonah, Jonah, you got issues, brother. Um, and so, you know, there's a Jonah element that we have to deal with, don't we? In our lives and in our relationships. That's the paradox paradoxical tension between Jonah and uh, and Christ. Christ is not like that. Christ did not. Christ was not bothered as much. He didn't need lots cast because his prayers were effectual. Did that make some sense? Right. It was no problem for him to go after prayer. Now what? Prayer worked. It really did. It didn't work for Jonah. It didn't work for a lot of people. And that's because what God will do after you and I learn how to pray is he'll tell us to engage in something else that I think is extremely important here. Uh, so I want to talk just a little bit because I got you for about 10, 10 more minutes. I want to talk a little bit about the danger of allowing for or participating in or promoting contention. So I want to talk about 
the danger of producing strife, promoting strife, when what we should be engaged in doing is preventing strife. People who produce strife love sitting in the storms. People who promote strife love to see other people ending up in storms. Y'all got that? And uh, the goal of the believer is to prevent strifes. We're called to be peacemakers. This is what I love about the Jonah narrative. Remember, prophetically, he points to Christ really clear. Practically, he actually engages in the ministry that Christ came to do, save. Take people out of the storm, bring them into peace, right? But personally, Jonah apparently didn't love people enough to actually want to stop strife. He caused it. Did he not? Right. And therein is the Jekyll and Hyde struggle that sinful human beings, even believers, can be inclined to fall into when you are immature and insensitive to the long haul effects of strife. There are long haul effects of strife. You and I can be taught to be strife ridden individuals from a child. From a child. And, uh, and it needs, we need grace to overcome that. So I'm going to share with you a few verses and then we'll move into point number two. Just touch on point number two. What now after that we have prayed and we will be ready to work on point number three on Friday and you will appreciate it because now we're going into the dark portal. Proverbs 6 verse 14 and 15 is what God reminds us. So here's what God says, Proverbs 6, 14. Forwardness in the heart. Uh, let me start at verse uh, 13. Let me see, because it, it's talking about the wicked. Ooh, it, it runs a ways back. Let me see, verse 12. See if it'll have a, 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 a beginning line. All right, a naughty person. You guys see that? A wicked man walketh with a forward heart. This is where you got to have a nice concordance in your Bible. And I would, uh, as I'm teaching some of you guys how to do Bible study, you want to have... Uh, a, uh, I would call it BibleHub.com. You want to get that one. BibleHub is a basic platform that you can have on your phone at all times by which you can pull up the verse, look at the grammar behind the verse, and look at the different uh, uh, cognates or alternative words that can be used for that English word. Because we're dealing with the King James here, and the King James has some, some great benefits but then it has some archaic words that can be hard for one to actually extract a sufficient contemporary meaning, okay? Even like the idea of a naughty person. What does it mean to be naughty? You know, you will immediately have what we would consider uh, uh, conventional and contemporary interpretations of naughty, right? But that's not what it means to do exegesis of the scripture. You can pour into that, that, that word naughty, all of your experiences, how many times your mama didn't call you naughty, all that. But that's not exegesis itself. Exegesis is getting behind the Hebrew grammar and understanding what that Hebrew word means for the word naughty there. And we can determine whether or not our King James brethren did a fair job of using an English translation of the Hebrew word as something that would approximate to the actual meaning of that term, all right? But we do all have a sense of what naughtiness is, right? And so a naughty person, a wicked man, I talked about that on Sunday, walks with a, and here's another word that's difficult, forward, heart. And that, that, that word that forward would also mean wicked or perverted, and it would imply... Um, the arrogance of irreverence. A forward person is a person who is irreverent. They are um, arrogant. They are people who act as if there is no God. And so there are no consequences to their frivolous behavior. Does that make some sense? All right, it's important to get that. We should not be that as believers. But we can be. And so notice what the next verse says. He winks with his eyes. He speaks with his feet. He teaches with his fingers. This is an abuse of the body. Because you already know that we're dealing with a character that's not acceptable with God in terms of his attitude and mentality. 
Now this next verse is giving us the kinetic expression of that wicked person. Am I making some sense? His winking is a problem because he's asserting having insights against somebody or for something for which he is able to have an advantage over other people. Does that make some sense? He's winking because he knows something somebody else doesn't know. He speaks with his feet. That is, his actions actually indicate what he is saying versus what he is saying. Is that coming home? He teaches with his fingers. The hands play a major metaphorical role uh, that corresponds to the will of man. Right. In, in many events across the spectrum of human experience, uh, contracts, legislation, rules are written out and they have the force of authority and they can ruin your life. Can they not? So now let's move on to uh, what God would say about this kind of person. Forwardness is in his heart. He devises mischief from time to time. Is that what it said? And I said, I want you to capture this because what we're talking about is contention. So we're going into the portal because we just got to look at it because Jonah is our lesson. If I'm sometimes like Jonah, I have to admit I'm the cause of the storm. Okay. We don't want to admit it. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just the messenger. Y'all can do what y'all want with that, but I'm just letting you know. If I'm sometimes like Jonah, then I'm sometimes the cause of the storm. I have to be honest about that. No matter what I think about myself, it's very possible that the storm that's going on right now, I cause that. Right? All right. So, and he devises mischief continually. I don't expect that to be the pathology of the believer. I do not believe that believers just go around continually devising mischief. They're not. They are called peacemakers. Their nature is one that they must, they must be like their heavenly father. That's the last verse in that narrative where Jesus says, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and abuse you in order that you might be like your father, which is in heaven, right? So we have a new nature driving us in that trajectory. So you're going to see a lot of fatherly like qualities in every believer. That means that this verse does not fit the believer in total, but we can go get a ticket every now and then. Can't we try to cash in? And it's stupid when we do. It's stupid when we do. Verse 15. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't go. Go back. Go back. Because the word here is he sows what? Discord. Contentions. Contentions. That's what discord is. It's contention. At the end of the day, that individual has created a division that has led to strife. And somebody now is at war, misunderstanding, misinterpreting, uh, uh, wounded, whatever the case may be. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Okay, there it is. Verse 15. Therefore shall his calamity, oh, there it is. This is called the quid pro quo. This is the brother whose middle name is calamity. And then when his calamity comes suddenly, he won't be able to negotiate it. See, we're negotiating the calamity in the book of Jonah, are we not? Because God is sending it not to kill anybody. That calamity is not going to kill anyone. Everyone's getting ready to be saved by that calamity. Is that not true? But there are calamities that come and wipe people out and they don't even have a chance to cry, ah, let alone bah, let alone forgive me, let alone Lord or save me. That's how quick they're going. Calamities can hit people suddenly. Am I, am I making some sense? Right. And, and, and you would know this. People are irrational who are walking in sustained contention with other people. Wouldn't that be the case? You're irrational. Because what makes you think you are a fence city that can see the totality of your landscape and you're sure you don't have a breach anywhere? That some enemy hasn't snuck in somewhere to, to get you? See what I'm getting at? All right, so it's important for us to recognize. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. There's the boat. The boat's about to be broken, right? 
The boat's about to be broken. But because that boat is not in this situation, it's under what we call divine sovereignty. And that's part of the consideration on Friday around the lot. The lot is about divine sovereignty. Um, here, there, you know, remember I talked to you about being, if you're God's elect, you're preserved. If you're not his elect, you just what? Reserved for the day of judgment? Well, reserved people check out all the time without ever having an opportunity to repent. The true believer is living a life of repentance. Repentance is intrinsic to their DNA. The true believer doesn't have to worry about checking out in a nanosecond because their whole foundation is rooted in repentance. Does that make sense? Right. And really healthy, short, quick prayers for the believer are drenched in repentance. The true believer operates out of a disposition of, Lord, forgive me, you, you know my foolishness, and I don't even know the extent of it, but, oh, God, cleanse me and purge me and, and wash me so that I might be, right? That's how the believer is. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly, suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. Verse 16. Let's make our way. These six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination to him. So I was talking to you about the benefit of raising our kids in the fear and the nurture of the Lord. So they learn Psalms and they learn Proverbs. Right, Victoria? Do you remember that proverb? Of course you do. We taught all our kids how to sing Proverbs chapter 6, verse 60. Have these kids learned that? Did they learn that? Yes. Six things the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Verse 17, a proud look and a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood. I think this is a 4-4 pattern on that one. A heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift and running to mischief. Verse 19, a false witness that speaks lies and the one that sows discord among the brethren. God hates that. That's crazy. You know what's crazy about that? It appears that professing Christians don't care about what God hates. Right? Apparently. I mean, like, so your father saying, hey, son, this is what I hate. I abhor this. We don't pay any attention to, to father. Right? All right, this is why the way that the father is talking to the son in the Jonah account is through a storm. All right. So when we're that backwards because we take our assignment personally, then, then God has to take his own assignment personally and he'll meet you with a storm as a child of God and send you into crazy, letting you know you're the one that's crazy. Right? Uh, and you know what's really bizarre about it? We can still take a long time figuring out that we're the problem. So I'm going to say this about point number two. I'm going I'm to I'm I'm just articulate it. We're going to pick it up on Friday. These are good studies, aren't they? And they are absolutely essential. They are absolutely essential because to whom much is given, much is required. And we, we have to be committed to grow. You have to be committed to growth. And a big part of growth is making sure that we cultivate the, the, uh, the tares and the weeds and the thorns of our own vineyard if we're going to be helpful to other people. Point number two says, what now after this, after that we have prayed and our text lays it out? Well, there are three sub points. We wait for an answer to prayer. That's one thing, right? We wait for an answer to prayer. Like when you pray, you wait for an answer to prayer. You don't rush to do something after you are praying. You wait for an answer to prayer. And what will often happen is the answer to prayer will tell you to seek counsel. Did that come home? All right. So it's really true. It's really true. We seek guidance in counsel. So remember, we pray. We've taken it to God ourselves. And we don't feel any relief. So now what do I do? Well, the word of God will tell you to seek counsel. What is God doing? He's humbling you. 
and forcing you to take the cave that you have created and put windows in that cave so other people can see in so you can get some light in that cave. Right. So this is what happens in marriages. This is what happens in the life of the individual Christian or in the life of couples. Whereas we should have a home or a, a uh, habitation with plenty of windows and a few doors where people who care about you can come knock on the door. Hey, have y'all turned into vampires because we ain't seen you for a minute. Right? You know what I'm saying is the truth. We think you're vampires because you didn't pull all the shades down. You didn't lock the windows. You not only have cut the lights off, you let the electricity go out. Now you're living in the darkness of your own self-inflicting narcissism. Does that make some sense? Christians do that a lot. Christians do that a lot. It amazes me when they finally come. I'm like, we could have easily solved this way back here. Right? Could have easily solved this way back here. You, 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 you said you're going to pray to God. See, so that one there, that prayer that you prayed, I'm praying about it. Okay. What you getting out of prayer? Well, I'm just still praying. Okay. <laughs> right. So, so I want you to think about this because I'm done right here. I'm done. I'm going to pick it up on Friday. So is God so dull of hearing that he can't show you that he has heard your prayers? Of course not. Of course not. Right. And so this is really about knowing how to pray right and listening for what the Lord has said to you out of it. Does that make some sense? Because very seldom is the Lord not saying anything to you because he has already said a lot to you. And sometimes he'll just simply tell you to go back to page 12, <laughs> section three, part B. And you'll get your answer there. But don't think you can play me. Because we love trying to play God. I mean, play him. Manipulate him. Like, you know, Lord, I done sent you 14 texts. And he'll say, I deleted 13 of them. <laughs> right? Because they were all an effrontery of acting like you're really seeking me. Because if you were really seeking me, you would simply humble yourself and find the right person's people authority to help you, right? So listen to the Proverbs. I'm done here. This is just one. Proverbs chapter uh, 11, verse 14. It doubles up in 15, 22. But Proverbs 11, 14, listen to what it says. Where there is no counsel, the people what? The person falls. The individual falls. See it? Notice what it goes on to say. But in the multitude of counselors, there's what? Literally salvation. All right, so think about this. What if the answer to your problem is 15 people around you who has already been there, done that, bought the T-shirt, actually owns the company, sold it because it was a bad company, and are willing to help you work your way out of that 15 people? And they're Christian. And maybe not. I'm, I'm even just saying on a human level, okay? Has not God given you the mechanism out? See what I'm getting at? Right. So why does God have to answer my prayer when I'm being too proud to, to listen to his word? When his word says, you know, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. God will tell you what to do. And all through your Bible, counsel is something that men and women have sought when the thing is too naughty. K-N-O-T-T. -T. Why? Too naughty for them, right? So there's a point at which humility says, all right, stop acting like you know. And because you don't know. And then stop acting like you got the end on God. God ain't talking to you. God ain't talking to you. Uh, uh no God now you know do y'all know that God will be silent? You better you better listen to me. I'm just being humorous because time is up. 
God will not talk to you sometime. Raise your hand if you know that. Right. He loves you too much to let you play him. Plus, he'd have been talking to you so long. Most of the time, he's just going to say, refer back to chapter 10, paragraph 3, part B. Right. Right. And, 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 and that will be often how God engages you and me. Um, because God wants us to be sincere with him and humble too. We can, we can uh, misappropriate um, counsel, but I doubt it. I doubt it. The most practically wise people in the world are people who know how to search it out and get help. 